so uh, I, I I guess this uh, will be a little digression for this uh, workshop, uh, <laughs> since uh, the the main goal of this uh, uh, work is uh, uh, try, trying to understand the holography and the space-time symmetry, space-time geometry. Uh, but you will see that this is uh, very related to uh, the topics you heard uh, earlier, like uh, tensor networks and uh, entanglement. <laughs> so uh, the motivation uh, of this work is basically some very basic thoughts about space-time geometry in quantum systems and uh, their relation to holography. So what I will call a poor man's understanding to holography, you will see it's very poor. Uh, and then, uh, so, so uh, then I will, after the motivation, I will talk about what exactly uh, I have done. So, so the definition of what I call the exactly, exact holographic mapping and uh, uh, applying that to uh, some very simple free fermion uh, but so the, the, the general uh, uh, the general procedure is you start from uh, uh, a boundary theory, which is uh, uh, some very ordinary uh, kind of matter <coughs> system like a free fermion and uh, on a lattice, and then you try to map it to a new basis, and then in that new basis you can read out the geometry, which ha which can have different geometry depending on what state you start from. And they may give you a way to uh, to probe the interesting geometries like a black hole, and then we will discuss. In the end, I will discuss the uh, interacting systems. So, uh, so just a very brief uh, overview of the background, uh, uh, which is the holographic duality. So, uh, I, so holographic duality was first proposed in string theory context, uh, starting from this paper of Juan Malcina and uh, the other two important works. Then uh, th it's an observation from the string theory that there are different theories which are, very, which are actually the same, which are due to each other. And uh, uh, the different theories are uh, super young mirror theory on one hand, uh, say four dimensions, and then uh, the gravity theory in five dimensions. But then the reason why this become more and more interesting, uh, and the condensed matter theory is also, uh, physics also got very interested in it, is that it also it has a, uh, uh, a more general uh, uh, understanding. So the interpretation, there is a more general interpretation proposed, which is that this, this duality is related to renormalization group, uh, which is also related to my approach. So, uh, so, so it was proposed that this additional dimension uh, in the dual theory is like a renormalization group, and the equation of motion is like a renormalization group equation in a very vague sense. Then, uh, then the, the holographic uh, duality, so uh, it, because it's like a generalization of renormalization group, it may give you a way to, uh, to uh, describe the, the uh, strongly correlated systems. Uh, then, uh, so, so, but but uh, uh, so far, most of the approach is like, I write down the, the bulk and boundary series and compare them. And it's not like I start from a boundary theory, like I give you a Hamiltonian and the ground state, and then uh, try to construct the bulk theory, the gravity, try to construct it from, fr from the boundary theory. So there are efforts uh, along this line, and, uh, and uh, what I would describe today is also an effort along this uh, direction, which is, mean, means you try to construct this bulk and understand what do I mean by having a gravity dual of a, a theory in the boundary. Uh, so I would like to start from some very uh, basic questions when we try to understand the uh, uh, geometry. What do we mean by geometry in the general quantum states? So we know following uh, uh, general relativity that uh, in classical mechanics, the, uh, in, in classical world, the geometry means, uh, now means the Riemann manifold. So we have points and then we have geodesic distance between points. So now if we want to generalize these, uh, these uh, uh, point and distance concepts to quantum, uh, systems, then there are two questions. How do we define points in our geometry, and how do we define distance between points? Of course, there are, in, in general, there can be many more structure other than distance uh, on the geometry, but uh, we are just taking the simplest one uh, <coughs> that, that, that exists in the Riemann geometry. So, so then, uh, here is uh, roughly uh, my proposed understanding to these two questions which we will become more specific later. So, so the, uh, I want to understand point as a, 
uh, as a, just a direct product decomposition of Hilbert space. So basically, you have a, a system. If I just give you a Hamiltonian, uh, which is a matrix in some basis and a, a ground state wave function, then that doesn't specify anything about basis choice. So you may write down your wave functions in momentum space or real space, right? So any different basis choice, which to be more precise, a basis choice means a direct product decomposition. Say I decompose my Hilbert space into, uh, into the Hilbert space of every site. Then whenever you give me this decomposition, then that defines a set of points. Every factor space is a point, so which may be momentum or. You all points are the same, so but hmm? your block of Hilbert oh. space are the same. Uh, not necessarily. There are different points. You you may in general you may have different points. I I won't have uh, different points, but uh, but uh, yeah, in general, um, I don't see why you have they have to have the same dimension. But uh, then uh, okay, so so then this choice is very arbitrary because I can choose momentum state space points or real space points. Uh, but so so then uh, why some of the choices are special? This is uh, related to the second question about distance between points. So uh, so I don't know how to define distance between points in general. I don't know what's the general principle, but but I believe there is a, a some very general uh, requirement of your definition of distance, which is it should be a function of physical correlation functions in the system. This is basically just just trying to trying to describe the relativity, relativity principle uh, in this quantum system. It says that the distance between two points shouldn't be something given by an exterior, external measure, but it should be determined by the dynamics of your universe. But there is, should be some way to measure it if you live in that universe. So you assume already has a Hamiltonian on the Hilbert space? I assume it has a Hamiltonian, yeah. So, 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 so I, I don't want to describe any system that that we don't know how to describe by, by our quantum mechanics. So let's assume it's just a standard man, quantum many body system with a Hamiltonian, and uh, it's either in the ground state or it may, in, it may be in the excited state. So in any case, it's a, it's a well-defined quantum motion. And then uh, the question is, if you just look at that system, uh, uh, how do you define geometry? Then, then the, uh, I want to say that you, you, you make a choice of this decomposition, and then you measure the physical correlation functions between these different points and then use that to determine the distance. And then you can ask whether that's a, well, that's a reasonable measure. If, if you get some very not local correlations, then that means this is not a, a good choice of uh, geometry. So, um, so, okay, so what do I mean by using the correlation functions to How determine? Can you possibly get non local correlations. You're defining locality by where the correlations are strong. So if things are strongly correlated, they're close by. So how can you get correlations that are not close by? Well, no, to be more precise, it's not uh, getting correlations that are not close by, but it's like getting some, uh, some points that are, like you, you may get a distance which, which, which uh, is far from the Riemann geometry distance we are familiar with. Like everything is close to each other or something like, or everything is far from each other. You may get some geometries that are very poorly defined, so that is, it's not useful to to describe it as a geometry. But could you define a distance by the Hamiltonian? Uh, you can, but uh, I, I I don't want uh, something that only depends on Hamiltonian because for the same Hamiltonian with different states, I can I uh, they, they can still have different geometry. Like I have the same Hamiltonian of my universe, but but uh, I can create some matter, and depending on the energy of this matter, I can get different geometry. So it's, it should be something that depends on both Hamiltonian and, and, the, and the, the state. Okay, so in general, I want this, uh, this uh, distance to depend on physical correlation function, and uh, if two things are more correlated, then they are closer to each other. So, so now I want to translate that into a formula. How, how do I do that? Uh, let's consider some very simple states of matter, which is massive states. Uh, all these states that, that have a short range correlation. So we know in general it's, uh, is not uh, uh, proved, uh, in general, it's not proved that short range correlation and the mass gap are the same thing. But let's take some state uh, which has short range correlation. Then, uh, for example, we can just consider this uh, mass, 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 uh, massive free fermion. So it's some dimerized chain, like a fermion hop down this chain with the dimerized hopping, then there is a mass. If there is no dimerization, then it's massless. So then when you calculate a, a correlation function then it decays exponentially if there is a mass, then uh, okay. So now uh, if I, I can now I can ask if I live in this universe, 
uh, what do I use? Uh, what's the natural way to measure the distance? Then you simply you can simply just back out, uh, just just reverse this formula and say, okay, uh, I can use this log of correlation function as a distance. So when this correlation function decays exponentially in distance, that means if you if you define your distance in this way at a long distance limit at, at a uh, long long range uh, large scale, you just re recover the familiar uh, Euclidean geometry. And you can generalize this uh, uh, also to time direction if you allow me to use the imaginary time. Real time, I, I don't really know. I, I still don't really know how to do it because there is oscillating correlations. In imaginary time, there is a, a decay, also exponential decay in this correlation function. So you can use the same uh, formula for uh, distance between space-time points. So, so okay. So, so now if we restrict ourselves to massive states, then there is a reasonable definition of distance which we know recovers our familiar geometry at a long distance. Is C always a real number? Uh, this one? Yeah. Uh, in general, uh, in general, it's not. So, so it's uh, multi-value. Probably I should uh, uh, I should use some absolute value or something. So so actually, if I use mutual information, I, I avoid this problem. So so what a what, what, if I only look at the spatial uh, correlation functions, then there is a way to avoid uh, this choice of uh, what correlation function you choose. So uh, otherwise, it sounds ambiguous. Maybe some correlation function is very short range, and there is another one hidden that you don't know that has very large correlation. So mutual information uh, uh, helps to solve that problem. So in, in this work of Matt Hastings and, uh, and collaborators, they show that, uh, that mutual information, uh, uh, which is defined as the entropy of the two sides subtracting the entropy of them together, uh, that, that's a bound, that's an upper limit, the upper bound of correlation function. So if you calculate this, and this thing decays exponentially in some way, then you are guaranteed that nothing decays slower. So, so then you can use that as a basis independent measure of uh, uh, equal time uh, correlation. And then I put that instead of a C in this formula. Yeah? The more, at least, the intuitive way to define distance in a Hilbert space would be in terms of the matrix element of some operator, say the Hamiltonian, between those two states. So is there a reason you don't want to use that definition for distance? Uh, as uh, I asked to, uh, I, I, as uh, I said earlier, uh, the uh, I don't want to define something that's only a function of Hamiltonian. Because for the same Hamiltonian, you can have different states, say ground state or finite temperature, they correspond to different geometry. So, so this spatial correlation between two points is not only a, a function of Hamiltonian, but also a function of the state you are in. Okay. Your definition only depends on the state, not on the Hamiltonian at all. My definition, well, if you calculate the different time correlator, it does depend on Hamiltonian. The equal time, of course, is determined by the state at that time. So, are there are other questions. So this mutual information one is only a space, not a space time. Mutual information is only space. So actually, it's an interesting question in general. Like, how do I generalize this uh, result that mutual information bounds the equal time correlator? Is it possible to generalize that to space time correlators? Is there a function I can calculate which generalize mutual information and that give me a give me an upper bound of uh, space time correlators? I, I don't know an answer. And, that's one thing we're trying. Well, G may be a ground state, or it may not. It may be also some other state. So, for any given state, I want to read out the geometry. <coughs> so, so G can be any state you're interested in. And then, uh, well, if it's a different time, then it, it's not only a function of the state, but also the time evolution Hamiltonian, given by the Hamiltonian. So. Uh, okay, so so far so good. Uh, it gives you a geometry definition for a uh, for, uh, uh, gap state. So, uh, but uh, something uh, funny happens when you go to gapless states. So, so, so in the gapless state, say you have some spin system living on this, uh, this flat space, then you de define the distance, then it re recovers the flat space metric in the, long in the large scale. So there is this triangle inequality. X Z plus Z Y is bigger or equal to X Y. But when you go to a, a critical state, imagine imagine you live in this universe. So you don't have another ruler to measure distance. You just measure the correlation function and then uh, use this uh, definition to measure a distance. Then now, if your system goes across a phase condition and the mass becomes zero, you get power law correlations like this. Uh, if you live in that universe, you 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 won't be able to know whether this behavior change comes from a change of geometry or comes from a change of dynamics on top of some geometry. So if you, if you still use this definition, 
you will see you will get a different definition of distance, uh, which now looks like a log of the flat space distance. Okay, so so if you live in a universe, you may conclude okay our geometry has changed to something like that. Right? The distance between two points becomes shorter, it grows slower. But uh, but if you think a little more, then you, you, you realize some more conclusions than that. You realize that it's not only a change of geometry, like in the sense of changing a, a Riemann metric from the flat one to a curved space. It's not like that. Because there's no metric which will give you this distance. Why? Because if you look at the triangle inequality, say, uh, take any three points, x, y, z, then the, it's true, the triangle inequality is still true. So dx, uh, z plus dy, z is bigger or equal to x, y. But uh, you never take the equal sign because the log function is that, like that. So, 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 you, so x, z plus dy is always bigger than x, y, even if, uh, they are, even if they are aligned on the same straight line, which means this, the difference is already minimized, but it's still finite. So, so for any Riemann geometry, you always have geodesic, right? So you, you can always take the third point along the geodesic so that the equal sign is taken. So this tells me that if, even if you just live in the universe, it tells you uh, it tell, uh, there is some way to tell that uh, that this this uh, that this this geometry is not really a Riemann geometry anymore. So so there are so you can do different things. Maybe you just admit that uh, that I have to define my geometry in a different mass. But uh, uh, but if you try to relate this uh, this observation to what you, to the Riemann geometry that you are familiar with. Then uh, uh, one way to one possible uh, solution is that that you can try to find a new basis. As I said, a choice of a set of points uh, is a, a set of uh, direct, uh, a direct product uh, uh, decomposition of the Hilbert space. So there is no a priori way to do that. So in, in this real space, uh, in, in like in this example, you have been taking this obvious uh, or this naive choice of a real space, which is what is given from your uh, your, your theory. You just call that. Like uh, you write on the uh, Lagrangian or Hamiltonian, and then you use this uh, this real space that we are familiar with. But uh, in this kind of case where the real space basis give you a, a, a weird geometry, then it's possible that you can transform to a different basis and define a new geometry there. And this is exactly the the proposal I want to make. That, that in these critical systems, there is a way to find this uh, a, a unitary mapping which brings you to this new basis where the geometry becomes the Riemann geometry again. And then, and then the way you do it, do it is basically you build this new dimension, and then you find the new geodesics such that, okay, now you understand that this triangle inequality problem is solved because, because all the geodesics go through the additional dimension. That's exactly why this holographic duality is natural for this critical state, even if we don't start from some special theory like string theory. Yeah. If you want to do a differential geometry, we need a metric, but we also need a way to parameterize the manifold so we can take partial derivatives of the metric. How are you parameterizing your Well, so far everything is discrete, so I, I, I don't really know how to define differential structure. But uh, uh, different uh, co different parameters, I mean different coordinates on the, on the manifold, uh, I think is part of the choice of basis. Like you, you do, a, a choice of basis means a way to decompose the Hilbert space. And then you can you can do the same decomposition but permute, label the sites in a different way. So so as a very special special case of this uh, different choice of basis uh, is a, a coordinate transformation. So I want to define a Riemann tensor. I need to take derivatives of the micro tensor with respect to some variable before you're taking derivatives with respect to. Well, you label your sites, and uh, and uh, if you really have a uh, continuum limit, which I, I believe we have, but I won't. Uh, so real space position. Or? What do you call the real space? So so what do you call the real space? Be depend on the depend on the new basis. Or maybe, maybe that will become clearer later, because I mean basically you need to define this unitary mapping, which defines the the basis, and once you define the basis, uh, you know what you what you mean by a real space point, or uh, what do you mean by an operator lives on any given point, and once you know that, you can take the derivative. So, 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 um, uh, so. In summary, what uh, what, uh, what what we have uh, learned so far is that that this uh, naive real space choice, which is given by when you write down the Hamiltonian, you call this real space. This naive choice may not be the best choice because that may give you a very uh, that when when you have a large correlation, then this 
the geometry you define is not so local. So, but you may be able to find a new basis. And then now I want to define what uh, pro propose uh, this new basis. At least uh, we know how to do it for some very simple theories, and then uh, we hope it works for more general theory. So, so let let me describe uh, uh, how do I define this uh, this basis. Uh, basically, say, say say your physical system is this uh, one dimensional chain, and uh, uh, in general, maybe interacting. Uh, I will take uh, I will describe uh, the system I will really uh, study is a free fermion, but in general, this definition works for the interacting system. So you have this one dimensional chain, and you may uh, this can be generalized to higher dimension also. So you uh, so you take this chain. And then uh, you define this unitary mapping, which is given by the triangle here. This unitary mapping which map the two sides in the two other sides. And then uh, these two other sides, uh, one of them is labeled color blue, uh, red, and the other one, the black one, goes to the next layer, and then you, you repeat this process. So basically, uh, physically what I want to do is I want to define this unitary mapping so that, so that this red one represents uh, high energy degrees of freedom of these two sides. And then the black one represents the low energy degrees of freedom. And then, so that's like a renormalization group, but now I promote this renormalization group to an exact mapping, because I didn't throw away this high energy degrees of freedom. I just separated them so that I keep track of the energy scale, but I didn't throw away anything or, or trace over anything. So then you take the low energy one and split it again to high energy and low energy. So, so this whole network, is a combination of a bunch of these unitary transformations. So in the end, you get a unitary transformation in the Hilbert space. So, so, so in the end, the combination of this whole network is a, is a unitary transformation from this blue size to the red dots. The number of blue and red is the same. And, and, uh, and then this, this is a, a, a modification of Mera. I will explain uh, in two slides uh, what exactly was the generalization here. So, okay. So this is just a more cartoon view of the same picture. So, so this this layer, which is covered, is this tree, this tree network. So the, the tree network I draw in the last is this this one, and the, and and the, you input these sides. Where when you you have these two sides coming in, and then there is this one going out of the out of the plane. Uh, uh, which is the red dot, and the other one goes to the next layer, and eventually everything goes out of the plane. So, so, so this defines this new red red dot basis, uh, which is just a basis transformation to the old one. So, so, so like in the old basis, you will call some operator here as a, a local operator, and then you can calculate correlation functions. But if it's a massless theory, you will see this correlation function decays at the power law and. But uh, now, uh, so the claim is that by defining this new basis, you can find that the correlation function between these points are actually more local because you have separated the different energy scales. Yeah. So in this meta construction, there's also these disentangles. You don't have them in your construction. I don't have them. I can add them, but I uh, because I I don't want to uh, uh, because I don't want to assume the different sides are 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 disentangled. So I don't really need the disentanglers, but. In general, uh, well, I don't really need this in Hamburg here, but in general, I may it may be good to have them. But so 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 that's really yeah. So I should uh, explain that uh, the relation to Mira. So so the relation to Mira uh, state is so Mira is an unsat state. And so so here here this network, this uh, orange uh, color layer, is a unitary mapping. So it doesn't specify any state. Although, although you, you would like to apply some mapping that's uh, suitable for a given state, but the mapping itself is just a unitary mapping in the fibre space. So, uh, so you have an output state in the bulk and the input state from the boundary. So it's some quantum circles. So Mera is an unsat state, which corresponds to you take a direct product state in the bulk. It's like every, every side spin up. You take some direct product state and reversely map it back to the boundary. And then you use that as an unsat state for your system. But as uh, Frank uh, pointed out, so this is not really a mirror. This is a tree tensor network. So if you really want a mirror, you, you have this, uh, this disentanglers in, 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 in the middle between the different. You have disentanglers between like these things. And uh, uh, you, you, you can't do that. You can introduce a, a, a tensor network with disentanglers. 
in the same way as Mira, but promote it, but, but uh, include this, uh, this uh, bulk indices so that this is a uh, uh, unitary mapping. And I will, uh, so, so it's basically you distribute the entanglement between the tensor network and the residual entanglement in the bulk. Confused by your color. So are you saying we are seeing the high energy state? Where you throw away the low energy uh, state? No, we don't throw away the low energy state. We just uh, uh, send them to the next layer and then s separate uh, them again. So, And what do we see is the high energy layer? In the end, it's, uh, well, it's the high energy here and then lower and lower and lower energy. But they're still higher than the one behind the wall. At each stage, the red dot is left behind is high energy, and the, right. the low energy is pushed upward. Right, so, so uh, 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 the, the thing behind the wall is just a unitary mapping in some quantum circuit. So you don't define energy scale for them. It's just that the output and the input, they, they, are, they are in quantum states. So you, you talk about like high energy, low energy degrees of freedom. So, so, so this is a coarse grain of view. Uh, which means you, you, you take the, your, your physical degree of freedom, split them in half, high energy here, low energy here. And then you split the low energy into higher and lower of that, of that low energy. And then you split oh, them again. Okay. Yeah. So you just, basically you just find a new basis where, where the new basis knows both real space and, uh, uh, and energy scale. So, um, yeah, so it may become more clear uh, when we go to the free fermion example. So, so this uh, 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 once you have this mapping, then then everything uh, we discussed earlier follows. That uh, when we once we map this uh, this uh, system uh, uh, to the new basis, then you define a bunch of local operators at every site, and then uh, you can calculate this correlation function, and you use either mutual information or some other correlation functions to measure your, uh, your distance. So, so you just repeat the same thing uh, which, you will, which you would do if you just use the original basis. And the statement is that you using the new basis is more meaningful. It gives you some more uh, Riemann geometry in the hyperbolic space. So that's the setting. And then, uh, then uh, let's apply this to a uh, very simple example which already give you interesting geometries. So uh, let's apply this to the massive, to the, to the Dirac fermion, which may be massive or massive. So, so this is a one-dimensional Dirac fermion, which is, uh, which is just a dis discretized version of the, the Dirac model, of the Dirac Hamiltonian. So you have some linear term and uh, a mass, and then you need to regularize the mass, and then you, you replace the linear term by sine k. So, so actually, Actually, another way to, to say that is that this model is nothing but a dimerized chain I draw earlier, which is like this. So, so you, you glue these two sides as one, so there are two bands. So it's, it's something, it's just some very simple, very simple fermion chain. So, so now uh, let's describe, let's define, let's define a unitary mapping. So I. I need to define this uh, unitary mapping, which uh, uh, maps the two sides to, to other sides. And uh, uh, here, the mapping is very simple. You just take, because you know this Hamiltonian has gapless modes near momentum zero. So the choice of the mapping is very intuitive. You just take the, the symmetric combination of the fermions here and here, and call that low energy state. And then you take the anti-symmetric combination, call that high energy state. So, uh, OK. So, so in, if you want to think uh, in a many-body uh, language, in a quantum circuit language, then it means that you take this four states of the two fermions. So here you have fermion 0, 1, and fermion 0, 1. Then you just take an equal weight superposition of the, the fermion 0, 1, the, 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 the states with the one fermion, and the states with the 0 or 2 fermions are um, and unchanged. But actually, actually, uh, I also have a spin index on each side, which is this, this spin index. But uh, the transformation is diagonal for that. OK, so, uh, so what does this transformation mean uh, when we repeat, it, re repeat this to form the whole tensor network? It actually uh, defines a very uh, simple basis change. Because I, as I said, uh, this is 
this, this, this unitary mapping in the Hilbert space just give you a new way to do direct product decomposition in the Hilbert space. And, uh, and in the free fermion case, the new way is just a, a single particle phase change because, because I have defined the mapping such that it's uh, quadratic. It, it, it's a linear transformation to the fermion operator. So, so in this case, it's just like a Fourier transform. It, it transforms to a new basis. Uh, uh, here, the new basis uh, uh, turns out to be uh, something you know uh, uh, that's uh, called a higher wavelet. So, so uh, it's a basis where uh, it's a basis where uh, w w which knows both the a length scale and the position. So basically, if you have a bulk, if I, I, I say I have a fermion local local here in bulk at this bulk site, what that means is you have a wave function on the boundary. Uh, at this region that's related by the tree. And uh, this will function is a step function like that. And then if you have a, a fermion at a different location, then it's just a different will function with the same shape but a different size and different uh, and the center mass position. So, so in a free fermion case, in the end, this tensor network just gives you a wavelet transformation. Uh, and you may modify it by adding these encounters and you get a different wavelet. So, so just a week ago, I learned uh, at Parameter that uh, Steve White has, some, has, has talked about uh, some similar uh, uh, wavelet transformations and relation to tensor network. I, didn't, uh, with, I think it's probably related to this. I just want to mention that. Um, so, so the reason why I choose this mapping is that you can look at the low energy. So, so, so after the first step of the mapping, every two sides is mapped to two sides, high energy and low energy. And then, uh, uh, remember, this tensor network just give me a, a, a unitary mapping. It doesn't define the state. So, so the, the, this, this blue size, the low energy size, actually couple to each other, because these sides are coupled to each other. So you, you map this uh, single chain problem to two chains of the low energy and high energy chains. And then you see that, uh, that if you only look at the blue, the low energy chain, their dynamics is actually described by a Hamiltonian that uh, has the same form as before, except the mass is uh, renormalized, become bigger. So, so that, that's why uh, it looks like this is a, a, a reasonable real space RG procedure. And when you do this, your low energy effective theory is uh, uh, your low energy effective theory is just uh, like a, a renormalized uh, Hamiltonian. But, uh, but, but uh, the difference from real space RG is now we have this high energy states and, uh, and we allow entanglement between different energy scales, which is essential for this geometry. So, so, so now uh, let's uh, uh, study numerically uh, correlation functions between these different bulk points and that will give us a, a measure of the, the uh, bulk geometry. So. Uh, uh, let's first uh, start from the massless theory. So in the massless theory, uh, actually by this construction, because the low energy effective Hamiltonian remains the same for massless theory, remains the same every step, uh, uh, except for uh, overall factor, uh, energy, factor of energy scale, then uh, actually this uh, Corina function in the bulk has scale invariance. So, so it's not surprising that when you calculate the distance between different points, you can actually re recover the uh, hyperbolic space metric because of the scaling variance. And uh, we can actually fit the metric by, uh, by the formula of uh, this geodesic distance in hyperbolic space to get, uh, the, to get the value of the uh, ADS radius, the curvature radius of the hyperbolic space. So you, you calculate this correlation functions and then take a log that define their distance, you compare that with the distance in the hyperbolic space, and that tells you that the curvature radius is something like 0.3 in the unit of lattice constant, which is reasonable because, because uh, uh, in every site, I mean, when you have a lattice in the ADS space, in the, side, in the region uh, of the size of ADS radius, there is uh, always, uh, the number of sites in it is always about the one. You cannot put too many things. Uh, in there, so you compare the, you can compare the distance in both uh, radial direction and uh, and uh, uh, angle direction, and uh, the the more okay you can also calculate the time direction, but the more interesting thing is when you go away from this critical state. I mean, the one one reason I want to 
to do this uh, this uh, this mapping, which is a generalization of uh, of uh, Mira and these tensor networks, is that uh, I don't like when I change from one state to another, I don't want to just change by hand this tensor network. Say I have a, a sharper entangled state, which means this this tensor network should end at some scale. That's what people usually say. But I don't want to do that by hand. I want to I want this tensor network this geometry to automatically emerge from your state. So here, if you keep the same mapping as before, uh, but, uh, but input a different state. Say, say I consider a finite temperature thermal density matrix. So now I have a new uh, set of correlation functions. Uh, just correlation functions behave differently. So when you define the geometry in the same way as before, you get a different geometry uh, on the boundary. Then uh, this, uh, this, different, this new geometry uh, uh, has some interesting features. So, so now let's first look at spatial correlation, and then we look at time direction. So the spatial correlation, uh, we know at finite temperature will decay exponentially in, in the flat space distance. So when you take a log and define the distance in this way, then the distance will grow linearly. So in, in, the, in the ADS case, it's log. Now, now you see it's log in the short range, and the crossover is linear at long range. And that's, uh, that's telling you that there is some scale in the center, because the, the closer you go to, to the center, uh, uh, the, the more you, you get a flat space distance rather than hyperbolic space. So when you have two points that are nearby, it's like hyperbolic space. And when you have two points that are far away, you get this, uh, this uh, different shape of the geodesic distance. And actually, you can, you can, you can measure this, uh, this what, I, what is actually a size of a black hole. So, so it means that. Uh, this geometry looks like a topological. Looks like a disk, like this this this, uh, this tree. It looks like uh, you have a disk bounding your your boundary system. But whether it's actually a disk or not is not determined by that picture. It's determined by the correlation function, right? So I can actually look at here and walk around this circle, and then uh, measure the parameter, which is like an area, uh, by measuring the distance of nearby points and then sum over them, right? So at a zero temperature, if you do that, you get some parameter which will decay when you go further and further away to the center. But uh, in the final temperature, because these sides are less and less correlated when you go to the center, you actually get a, a you, you actually see this parameter saturates to a finite value. So, so you actually see something like this, like the, the, the parameter when you walk around this, uh, this, this center region actually saturates to a finite value. So that means the space time, the space has been broke, broken up, and then there is a hole in the center. Although, although it looks like a tree, but when you walk around it, you see there is a finite parameter that you cannot, you cannot go shorter. So, so, so this geometry is actually an outside exterior geometry of a black hole. But this doesn't tell me why is that black. Why is, I mean, it tells me there is a hole. But why is that a black hole? So, so you can see that's a black hole because you can measure the uh, you can measure the time direction correlation. We know a black hole horizon has this uh, very special property that it's a single side it's a light like surface. Right? When you jump in the black hole, you cannot go out. So 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 uh, another way to say that is you when you jump into the black hole, someone from outside will see this infinite redshift. You see you slow down, and then all all the signal you send out will be infinitely redshifted. So that's exactly what you can check here by calculating the time direction correlation. So you calculate the correlation function between two points that are, uh, that are the same spatial location but different time. So uh, I, uh, I don't have mutual information, so I calculate, uh, I calculate uh, just a single particle correlation. And then you see that when you go further and further to the inside, to the infrared region, then the correlation grows slower and slower. And there is actually a region in the center where the correlation almost doesn't grow. Sorry, the, the correlation almost doesn't decay. So when you translate it into the distance, the distance almost doesn't grow. So what that means is this is imaginary time. So imaginary time is a circle. It means there is an infrared region where the circle is almost uh, vanishing. The, the radius of the circle is always vanishing, almost vanishing. That's exactly what happened near the black hole horizon. Because you, so, and, and, and physically here, this, this gives you a a very intuitive into, uh, interpretation why finite temperature state is due to a black hole. Because, uh, because you separate the degree of freedom into energy scale. And when you have a finite temperature, there is a region in your system which has energy scale small, much smaller than temperature. So effect effectively, that region of the universe is in high temperature limit. 
So consequently, there is no much non-trivial time evolution. So when you do time evolution, it's like doing time evolution to a infinite dimensional density, infinite temperature density matrix, which is one. So, so there is no much time evolution, which tells you that uh, this infinite redshift. That's exactly the, where the infinite redshift comes from. Uh, so, so you so you see that even from this uh, free fermion state, we can actually read out this. Uh, uh, Interesting uh, uh, geometries like a black hole, and you can actually try different geometries. I, I will, uh, because I'm running out of time, I will skip more of the uh, detail of other geometries. Uh, but uh, uh, what this is one thing I want to mention is uh, this infrared regime. Although every site, although every site is uh, very little entangled with each other, they actually entangled strongly with the thermal bus. So they actually have uh, uh, this maximum entropy. So you see that uh, this, uh, the black hole entropy here uh, appears as the uh, entropy of each site, which is the entanglement entropy of each site with the, with the thermal bus uh, in this uh, stretched horizon region. So, so you can study different geometries, like a massive state where you see there is a spatial boundary, but, not, but the time direction doesn't have infinite redshift. So it's like a confined geometry where, where the geometry ends at some scale. And then you can actually further study the black hole by uh, turning on um, by, by, by considering uh, uh, two chains which are entangled with each other, so this is called the thermal double state, where the whole system is a uh, uh, the whole system is a uh, uh, is a pure state. But if you look at only one system, uh, it's a you know thermal ensemble. Then when you look at this state, then you can do the same mapping for both of them. Then that actually tells you directly that you can calculate the distance between these two points. You can calculate the distance which are right between two points that are right on top of each other. Then you see that their distance is extremely small in the region in the infrared, and that's telling you that there is a wormhole formed between these two disks. So at zero temperature, there are two disks. Each of them is a hyperbolic space, and uh, at finite temperature, there is this wormhole formed, and uh, uh, and that's exactly uh, inconsistency with uh, the classical picture of a two-sided black hole when you have a einstein rosen bridge. And you can actually study more interesting geometries like a quantum quench. Uh, and so, and uh, quantum quantity in this geometry. So uh, that's uh, 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 so. Instead of uh, uh, talking more about these geometries, let me briefly comment uh, uh, on this uh, uh, interacting system, which may be more relevant to the to, to this uh, this workshop. Uh, one one or two minutes. So. Um, so I mean, so far I have been uh, applying this mapping to a free system, and then the, so free system, of course, we don't need to s we, we know how to solve it. So the only interesting thing is you can read out some interesting uh, geometry from it. But uh, for from a more kind of matter motivation, you would want to use this as a, a way to describe the interacting system. So so uh, if you want to describe if you want to use this mapping as a way to describe the interacting system, uh, it's basically like applying it as a generalization of MERA. <coughs> Then uh, what you want to do is you want to reverse this uh, mapping and start from some bulk state, map it back to the boundary, and use that state you get as an unsat state. If you start from a direct product state, and then maybe you use some disentanglers in the network, then that's the MERA state. So now the new possibility we have by modifying this mapping to a unitary mapping, the new possibility we have is we can introduce a bulk state that is short range entangled, but it's not a direct product state. For example, we can use a free fermion box state, which is shorter in entangled, and uh, and uh, and that's that's the new possibility that's allowed by this approach, and uh, and uh, there is a a causal cone structure in this tensor network, uh, which uh, uh, tells you that that it's efficient to calculate correlation functions between two boundary points if you know a way to calculate bulk reduced density matrix. So in general, if you have a box state which we don't know how to calculate reduced density matrix then it's very hard to do anything. Uh, uh, but uh, the statement is that if you have a box state, say free fermion state, uh, for which you know how to calculate reduced density matrix of this regime, then the boundary state correlations are all determined. And uh, as an interesting consequence of that, uh, so this is just showing the, how, this is just showing, uh, just proving the statement I was saying that, that actually the boundary reduced density matrix is determined by the bulk reduced density matrix in that region. So, so then the interesting consequence is you can actually study a scale invariant network and directly calculate scaling dimensions in the same way as in MERA. And then you can plot the scaling dimension spectrum 
And the difference from Mira is that you have this box state. So your scaling dimensions of the operators is determined by the mapping, which are these triangles, and the box state. So even if my mappings are very simple, I can, I can have a lot of operators uh, because uh, of my box state. Say uh, my box state is, even if my box state is like a free fermion, this, uh, uh, it can give you a, a big tower of, uh, of uh, uh, scaling dimensions. So this is some numerics. Uh, uh, this is uh, done by Yi Zhang uh, or postdoc at Stanford. So uh, you see the, uh, you get a nice tower of scaling dimensions, at least the, the, at least the counting is correct for the lower dimension ones. And this, this is just re, this is not so this is not so non-trivial yet. This is just re, re, restoring the behavior of free from it. But now, once you have this, you can generalize it to interacting systems. So you can calculate this uh, scaling dimensions of operators. So that's all I, I want to say. And in summary, it's it's a it's a new it try try it's a new way to try to understand the geometry relation to quantum entanglement and. Uh, uh, also, a way to describe a, a strongly correlated systems. Of course, there is a lot of open questions, like the relation to the well-known uh, ADS CLT approach and large limit. Thank you. Uh, so, the free fermion theory is a proposal to be due to a uh, high spin. A gravity theory, which has uh, which has given the number of fields one one per each spin. So, uh, I, so the relation of this approach to that is not uh, uh, clear yet. But uh, my conjecture is uh, this free theory. So what I get is a. Um, but the conjecture is this. So so so. We have this uh, d-dimensional free fermion on the boundary, and then uh, what I propose here is is uh, due to a d plus one dimensional also free fermion in the ADS space, and then there is the other proposal that if you only look at the the say you take a, a these to be O n vectors, and then if you only look at the O n singlet sector, this is what Sirius Vasilyev theory, which has an infinite number of high spin fields. So, uh, so the conjecture is that this thing, when you just project it to the singlet sector, it actually gives you the same theory. So the statement is that you have this infinite number of high spin fields, which are all interacting with each other. But actually, that's just because you are looking at a free theory. Uh, uh, you are looking at a subsector of a free theory, which contains these bilinear operators that are singlet. So it's like it's like high dimensional bottomization. Like you instead you insist to describe a free from free from uh, Fermi liquid by uh, by looking at this uh, particle hole operator. So then it's a very complicated interacting model. Yeah, there's something I don't understand. Um, what what is like you say, a new approach to studying strongly correlated systems like we do in tensor product states and so on. But, I mean, is the goal also to understand the space-time geometry somehow? Because, I mean, you're putting in some geometry, right? You put in the basic Hamiltonian, okay? That maybe has local interaction in 1D, but then it's critical, so it, generate, it realizes a new geometry. But you put in some, you know, physical geometry. So, I mean, you know, that's yeah. a bit artificial, I would say. Right? Well, and, and the other question is, I mean, you can get something new, but the other question I think is like, okay, can I get any geometry? I mean, how about Minkowski geometry? Did you, I mean, Euclidean, okay, but I mean, is this some general formalism or is it just sort of a coincidence that, oh, hey, the Mira and the ADS, that matches? Or I, that's what I don't see. Well, so I how think, systematic well, it's it's certainly it's don't have answer, maybe I just asked oh. related the same question. So how do you know the dimension? From just a tensor network, you have to input. I don't think you can emerge in the dimension. How do you use a manifold at all? Okay, so I, I don't. I mean, I certainly don't have a complete answer to these questions. But uh, but uh, if you, I mean, th this approach is trying to go towards these directions. I mean, um, so so com so previously, I mean, the relation of tensor network and uh, geometry is is like you discretize the geometry into a tensor network. So so here, I mean, it's true that it, I mean, when you choose this mapping. Uh, it's like a choosing a, a background geometry to expand around. It's like it's not a background independent approach. Yeah. But uh, um, 
But what but other geometries can you get then? Uh, so. Yeah. So 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 the okay. So I'm still yes, in the sir, first yeah. question you're asking. So so at the, about the first question. Uh, so here the approach of starting from a boundary state and then choose this mapping and then get the box state is basically like a discrete version of you give me the boundary condition and then uh, I, I I start from a, a a background geometry I choose and then uh, I know the quantum fluctuation around that geometry. So 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 when I choose this mapping, maybe it's like I choose this background geometry to be ADS, but then uh, I, the quantum fluctuation can tell me that if my boundary condition is different, then I get a different geometry like a black hole. So so it's like a first order perturbation. It's like it's not background independent, but I start from some background. I know where to go. I, I know where is the correction. So that's just one step better than just drawing the network uh, and say that's my state. So, so I think it's going to that direction, but it's not. It's certainly not background independent uh, 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 yet. So, uh, uh, the second question about other geometries, uh, it seems natural to get a hyperbolic geometry because uh, I want my bulk boundary degree freedom to map to the bulk. So, so if it's not hyperbolic, then there seems to be too many degree freedoms in the bulk. But on the other hand, uh, it, it may not be. Uh, when we try to generate, one thing I'm doing now is uh, uh, we're trying to generalize this to a continuum formalism. And, by do and, and the way to do that is you have to introduce auxiliary degrees of freedom to fill in this empty space. So in the end, what you get is a theory that looks like living in deep part one dimensions, which may be flat or maybe hyperbolic, depending on the metric. It lives in the deep part one dimensions, but actually the physical degree freedom, which has natural dynamics, is only d-dimensional. So, so it's not clear to me. Uh, I mean, it seems that it's possible to cook up some Correlation functions that gives me a flat space or the theta space correlation. It doesn't seem to have any princ uh, principle which uh, uh, against that, but I, I don't have an example yet. But you certainly can get different geometries. Like if I give, if I have a free, uh, Fermi liquid, then uh, it will be a very different geometry. So the correlation behaves very differently. Yeah, but the dimension uh, about the dimension then is. Uh, well, you, you have different ways to define dimension. If you define a Hausdorff dimension, then there is certainly a way to calculate it. But I have the distance, so you can you can calculate the Hausdorff dimension. How's the first value defined? Uh, yeah, well, I guess it's the infinity here because it's How is infinity? Hausdorff dimension is the infinity here because the 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 volume scales like the exponential function of the radius, but, which is true for all the hyperbolic spaces. But, but if you if you have but well, but you you have, you have something better than that, right? You can calculate the Mm. Well, you probably need to restrict your lattice to certain spectral lattice. That's something you have to do. Well, well, it's like a self-consistent approach. Like I, I draw this lattice, which is like a discretization of some manifold. But uh, if you don't do it uh, correctly, then in the end, uh, your distance cor from correlation function may give you a completely different thing. But what? But what I make is like the first first order probability thing. Well, the case when it makes sense is uh, is when when your correction is not uh, too uh, severe, like, uh, like you have a classical geometry given by this uh, lattice, and then the, the correlation tells you that your real geometry is uh, something nearby. So usually to get this kind of nearly classical uh, gravity, you need to take some large gem limit, but here you have n equals 1, I guess. Right? Yeah, so, so that's a very good question. So. Uh, the statement is not the geometry is classical. It's a. Uh, it's basically like, yeah. I, uh, it's it's like you, you 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 make some coordinate choice by defining the map, and in that coordinate choice, you can consider some average geometry. Your geometry is fluctuating, and the average geometry is hyperbolic. Say if you have a massless theory, and the fact that the geometry is not semi-classical is shown in the fact that the fluctuations in that box theory. Is all free fermion. There is no graviton or anything. So, in other words, if you create a graviton in the box, it will immediately decay into free fermion. So that's a signature that tells you that there is a lot of quantum fluctuation because there is no largeness. But the statement is just that there is a lot of like this geometry is far from uh, classical. Doesn't mean it must be very complicated. It, it can be just a free fermion. This free fermion in the box plays the role of graviton in this in this system. But of course, it's very interesting how do I take some larger limit and really recover this more familiar classical geometry. Uh, in the, the living model is uh, also a fixed point of RG. Right. And uh, 
structure of tensor network is fairly similar. Yeah. Oh, is what well, is very similar to. Uh, I mean, it's, it's it's basically mirror. Uh, yeah, but I thought you don't really need a mirror because because it's like it's something with zero correlation net. Right. Exactly. That's that's my question. Well, can you? Well, I mean, there there you see it's a state with the correlation net zero. Right. Then with the in the head, it admits mirror description. What what does your performance say about that? Uh, it. Um, I think uh, I think that's a, a case where the bulk state is. Completely dual product state. Uh, yeah, I know there is a rigorous mapping. There, there is a there is a rigorous way to write down the Levin as a mirror state, and that means a mirror state here, in my case, translated into uh, the statement that the bulk degree freedom has no entanglement between each other. The bulk bulk degree freedom are dual product of each other, so all the entanglement is taken care of by the map, by the mapping network. And and I think that you, for the model because the correlation length is zero, so you, so you actually have nothing interesting in the bulk. So basically, you, you can just finish your mapping in one step, and then, and then your geometry is uh, is uh, confined. I mean, it's like it's like all the all the uh, massive systems. Right? You, you're, what you really need is just some finite size of the mapping. You don't really need to continue. And if you insist to continue, you will see that the sides here are all non-correlated. So the geometry I get will be all these things are are points that are disconnected to each other. So the only interesting geometry is in this region, which is when you renormalize the finite correlation length to zero correlation length. Yeah. So what happens if you use a Fermi liquid status input with this mapping? Do you get anything sensible, or do you need to use a different mapping to this? I think eventually I need a different mapping. Uh, so, so basically, if I use this mapping, what I see is something like uh, we did that, but um, I don't expect this answer to uh, to be completely meaningful. But you got something like that. You got some geometry with a throat, because because this mapping is separating degree freedom into length scale. It's not really energy scale into length scale. And for the Dirac Fermi on the low energy, long wavelength is low energy. But for uh, if I have a finite coming potential, I can apply the same mapping. Then the low energy things are not long wavelengths. It's some finite wavelengths. So it's something like that. So, so here, here at, at some finite wavelengths, the correlation is the most uh, long range. So when you translate it to distance, it's the most uh, small, it's the <coughs> slow, shortest distance. And then, then later, there is a, another ADS here, which tells you at low energy, there is some ADS correlation. At long wavelength, there is some power operation. So, uh, but but I, I think uh, to really have a, a better description, we need to go to continuum limit because in general you have incomparable uh, Fermi wavelengths and uh, and this kind of wavelet approach cannot really capture, cannot really describe this correct renormalization group procedure for Fermi liquids. Oh. Here's this uh, question about the when the box here is simpler, yeah, right, sure. Is there some reason to believe it would be simple, let's say for a 1D CFK, 1D CFK, 1D CFK, is there some reason to believe the top theory would be simple? Well, the general reason is the box theory is uh, sharper than correlated. It has a correlation function which decays exponentially. So that, that's why, I mean, if we have better understanding to massive states than massive, mm -hmm. then hopefully that works. I mean, for example, what people do in ADS CFT is, I mean, also here, like the, the scaling dimension is translated to mass in the bulk. So it sounds easier to tune the mass than tuning the scaling dimension. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, thank Xiaoyang and all the speakers today.